welcome everyone to Liberty Chat, our first episode of 2022. My name's Kirsty O'Sullivan. We have our three very esteemed panelists here, Mr. David Limbrick, our lead Senate candidate for Victoria. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. How's it going? And Mr. Campbell Newman, our lead Senate, Senate candidate for Queensland. Hi, Cam. Happy New Year. Happy still New Year. That, can't we? It's only the fifth. Of course. Uh, and Mr. John Ruddick, our lead Senate candidate in beautiful Sydney town. How are you, John? Terrific. Good to be back. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year to you all, too. Exactly. Well, it's been, it's going to be a massive year, obviously, as well. And you may be asking, oh, Kirsty, what are you wearing? Why? I am wearing <laughs> Kirstie, one. Kirsty, what are you wearing? <laughs> well, I am wearing this fabulous uh, polo shirt with the Lib Dem logo. I also just happen to have a cap right beside me, Goodness. as well as a bucket hat, not modelling. Right now. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Uh, we've got badges, we've got stickers, all sorts of stuff going on on our website now. So we have added the shop site to the website. If you get to ldp.org.au, scroll over a little bit. You'll see that on the main menu bar. And uh, yes, howdy from Prison State of WA over there. I see some chats coming up, which is lovely. Um, but yeah, get to the website. Uh, you've got the regular T-shirt. There's polos. There's chambray shirts. There's all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, What's a so chambray shirt? You know, those blue ones that are kind of a bit more like a business shirt type thing. Yeah, okay. no. Um, they're a bit nicer for more of a business appearance. So okay. you guys should all definitely have one of those for, for sure. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's all there. So obviously we're going to spruik that. Um, and as I said, we do have a very big year coming up. We've got a federal election coming up within only a few months. Who knows when? It hasn't been announced yet. So, but, you know, we are sort of getting fully into campaign mode all over the country. So... Let's start a little bit with a bit of a catch up. Who's been doing what? David, what's been happening for you over this whole Christmas, New Year's? What have you been up to? Uh, well, <clears throat> the highlight of my last few weeks has been um, going to the Scouts uh, Jamboree a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> so wholesome. Yeah, Vic Victorian Jamboree. Um, I mean, this is something that um, I've been uh, really passionate about because there was a big problem with the um, vaccine mandates for kids and kids in the 12 to uh, 17 year old age group, about 10% of them were unvaccinated. And because of the mandates that came in, a lot of kids weren't able to take part in activities, including the Victorian Jamboree. And um, I've got two boys that are actually at the Jamboree right now. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> uh, after much pressure, which I think we can claim a lot of credit for, uh, the government lifted the mandates on children, which is a wonderful relief for, for many parents, I'm sure. And um, the Jamboree went ahead and all the upset parents and children that weren't able to go were able to go. So um, uh, I was very honoured to be invited there as a VIP mm -hmm. and uh, went along there. Tim Quilty came along as well. And um, there was another Liberal Party MP, a few councillors and also the Governor General. <laughs> um, I got to see the Governor General go down a zip line, which I said in a video the other day, I didn't expect to see that in the morning. I didn't, I didn't know the Governor <laughs> General was even going, um, let alone that I'd get to see him go down a zip line, mm. His Excellency go down the zip line uh, at, at Vic Jam. But um, look, it's, it, you know, the, the event itself, the amount of work and that they've done into putting this together is just amazing. They told me that they're effectively setting up and tearing down a town the size of Kyneton, right? Including supermarkets, facilities, um, and activities like you've never seen so many cool activities. They had hatchet throwing, they had rock climbing, they had um, uh, IT stuff. Um, they had, they did, a, a, um, they got a ham radio tent and they communicated with the International Space Station the other mm -hmm. night, like, and had a conversation with astronauts and uh, apparently. A couple of nights ago, they chopped a car in half and had motorcyclists doing tricks and they had fireworks better than Melbourne. Like, it was just absolutely amazing. And I was so happy to see it and so happy to see it go ahead. So that was my highlight recently. And the other thing that's happened is this whole, um, I think the mandate, the vaccine mandate thing is really coming to a head now. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of people questioning the, the well the science around it i've always questioned the moral morality of it but the science itself you know the idea was that it's sort of gonna you know slow down the spread mm -hmm. of 
um, uh, COVID in the in the workplace and stuff like that. And I think Omicron's just sort of knocked that whole idea on the head. And lots of expert, experts have been coming out and saying, no, nah, no, nah, there's no scientific basis for it anymore. They've got to go. Um, well, even gonna- now, of course, the big news today in Victoria that Novak Djokovic is going to be playing the Australian Open. Which is wonderful, it. which yeah. is wonderful. and I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, he 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 uh, contracted COVID last year. Um, mm. He's declined to um, divulge his vaccination status. Mm. Somehow he has an exemption. Um, I think he's probably the only person that I've actually met who's successfully got an exemption. Yeah. I know mean, many people that probably deserve them, uh, but they haven't got them, but somehow he got one. But I don't, I don't um, uh, hold that against him. I'm happy that he comes here and causes trouble. And um, <laughs> if he is the, if he is the uh, catalyst that um, ends the mandates, I'll, I'll be happy to set up a crowd fund for a statue for him or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very well, happy about it. It has been quite funny seeing some of the I Stand With Dan crowd just losing their mind over this and saying, Dan, I've stood with you through thick and thin, but I can't do this. And, and Rukshan actually had a, uh, a great Twitter thread on it as well. It's been quite funny. PR guy has been losing his or her mind. Um, Campbell, what's been happening up there in Queensland? Obviously, I am from Queensland. I'm seeing some crazy stuff happening up there with mandates and police tearing into bars and people going nuts. What, what's happening in Queensland? Well, I think just what I'd like to cover is sort of the political situation at the moment in Queensland, um, where I think the federal election is going to be fought and what we've been doing in terms of the campaign. Um, prior to Christmas, I sort of went to a number of quite big rallies. Um, one, for example, in the Redlands, 2,000 people on a Monday night, just mm-hmm. gigantic, run by a community awesome. group. Another one at Slacks Creek in the, uh, an evangelical church there with about 700 people. Another one at Ipswich um, um, with probably two or 300 people in a restaurant and people very fired up. And it's about the mandate. It's about coercion, uh, yep. particularly. Um, and so I think there is quite a strong undercurrent out there or below the radar, there's, a, there's quite a, a large group of people who, you know, have not been picked up by, you know, the major political parties. They don't get it. Um, it's not in the polling, I think, but they're very, very angry. Um, and we're with them 100%, of course. I think now we're reaching what I'd call peak COVID mania. You know, it's a bit hard to make a, a statement like that in a state as large as, as, as Queensland, but I think nationally we're, we're now getting to the reality moment because the numbers are exploding with Omicron and people are starting to know people who've had it and people who've recovered um, who are fine. Um, and, you know, I think now, uh, you know, that we're seeing here with the cases going through the roof, a bit of a, a reset by the chief health officer. He's... Uh, a lot more sensible than the previous yes. incumbent and in the role, yes. uh, but you can see him repositioning, trying to say to people, "Well, you're going to get it." Essentially, mm. is where he is, um, and there, he and the government are really trying to reset and manage expectations. Mm. There's still, from us, for us politically, um, there are still big opportunities for us to, to 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 be champions for the community, to be pushing back against vaccine mandates. Uh, QR codes pointing out it's ridiculous that after two years that there are, you know, five, six, seven hour queues. Like a young man who works for me in my business went to get tested yesterday with his girlfriend because she works in a hospital. They waited five and a half hours and eventually had to give it away. They never got tested. It's insane. It got sunburned. <laughs> it wasn't good. Yeah. So, you know, there's the border, the border sort of changes, the, the constant inconsistencies and, and stupidity of some of these laws. Um, that's happening. There was an interesting thing we were leaked um, over the last 24 hours. I've posted on Twitter and Facebook. The police essentially were directed, well, the police station at Ipswich anyway, this is where this seemed to have come from, um, were directed to actually not arrest people who couldn't be bailed. Because they didn't, they didn't have the ability to safely Hold them. incarcerate them in the watch house. So literally, we've got in writing. It's on Twitter. Quite interesting, um, you know. And um, you know, you know, what what are they going to let sort of if, if they, they can't bail murderers and rapists and pedophiles? 
Um, so they're just not going to arrest them, are they? Well, and I did see the Ipswich Hospital was considered a hive of COVID festering. Um, yeah. I've been through Ipswich and, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. But, yes, so that's interesting that that, that the police are going to do that whilst Ipswich is now considered this, this infested piece of COVID spreading. Uh, speaking uh, of... Just, oh. just then turning to the election, look, uh, you know, this, this may be different in each state, but I just want to say, particularly the Queenslanders, we believe the campaign team and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment, the campaign team and I really do believe that the election in Queensland is going to be fought on other issues by the time we get mm. there. Yeah. We believe that it will be fought particularly where the Prime Minister wants to take it, which is on the economy, on aren't we great, we kept you safe, look at all the jobs that have been created and scaring you know, people about the external threat and you know, the, the whole thing about national security in China and, and stuff like that. Um, that's very much where, he, where he's going. Um, in terms of the campaign, just a bit of few changes. Um, unfortunately, Mark Horitzik, who is our Queensland campaign director, has com significant business commitments as well. So he, he came to me in the last uh, week and said, look, he couldn't continue as the director, but he wants to continue on as the comms guy. So he's actually still in the campaign, but he's stepping back just a notch. Uh, Michael Pucci, who has been the national campaign director, has said, Look, he really wants to help um, in the Queensland campaign. So he tendered his resignation as the national campaign director and he's actually now uh, taken up the role as the campaign director for Queensland. So sorry about that national campaign, but they've sort of realigned in the Queensland team and they've got um, the structure filling out quite nicely. We've got a number of people, probably about a dozen people in various slots. On any day you'd go in there, there's usually about five people in the campaign headquarters now yeah, going good. well. And um, the campaign office uh, for anyone in Brisbane is in Yurong Pili. What's the Yurong address Pili. again, Cam? Yurong Pili. Pili. Uh, I haven't got it right in front of me, but yes. We, we, you can we, send an email in because, yeah, they do have a, a great team up there yeah, in Queensland. A great, great setup. And, you know, that's a, um, sort of from a, from a, from a supporter. Uh, we continue to do fundraising. Um, in February and March, I will be doing consistent fundraisers each week. We'll be doing events all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be going to regional Queensland between the 21st and 25th of February on a trip right up the coast. Uh, yeah. Probably programming another one. I'm going to do to the Toowoomba Show weekend in March, late March. Uh, just so people know, that we, the candidates, uh, shot some videos for the party about the uh, Freedom Manifesto prior to Christmas. So we've all done ones which will be released in our, obviously, on social media, uh, and you, you'll be seeing those not in the not-too-distant future, and they really are about selling what those things are, uh, those policies are. Uh, and the final thing I really wanted to say was the issue about candidates. It's great. We've now got um, um, Damien Curry uh, pre-selected for the seat of Ryan, Diane Dimitri for Moncrief, Alexander Forbes for Fadden, Daniel Freshwater for Lilly, Michelle Jakes for Blair, uh, Jens Lippiner for Longman, and Glenn Pine for McPherson. Uh, there's um, uh, a young woman who's been uh, pre-selected to be a Senate candidate. Uh, I'm not sure where she's going to come on the ticket, two or three, but I'm not sure whether I'm a mere candidate like me is allowed to say who she is this evening, <laughs> so I won't. But there's another female candidate um, uh, a lady uh, who's also a great candidate who's uh, uh, vying for pre-selection for a Senate um, slot as well, which That's is brilliant. really well, stuck. We have two very wonderful uh, female Senate candidates down here in, in Melbourne as well. I guess my final thing is just I, I really sort of want to sort of make the point we, we really got to go into a mode now of professionalism. Mm. You know, we've really got to sort of gear up. We've got to get going. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to be sticking to message um, and the message is going to be different, I think, in different states, as I alluded to before. Yes. But, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got, we've all really got to run from now on because it's going to be a long campaign potentially all the way through to May, God forbid, but we've got to, but so we're going to pace ourselves. We've got to get going though. It, mm. it, there's, there's, there's no time to be wasted. Most definitely. And before we, we jump to John, I just want to say, obviously, 
Everyone get to the website, ldp.org.au, join the party, volunteer. We've got really active volunteer coordinators around the country. Uh, if, it depends if you've got particular skills, even if it is handing out flyers and hand of votes uh, on the day. But we'll I, get back just, to that later. I was just going to oh, say, I agree with Campbell that um, a lot of the issues that we're talking about now with regards to COVID what probably won't be issues mm. intentionally by the time we get to the election. And I think what you talked about with economic recovery is certainly going to be a big issue. And, you know, debt and inflation is the big thing that's looming on the horizon. Sorry, yes, David, absolutely. Yeah. Um, inflation, and I think should be, I, yeah. It sounds boring, but, like, this is going to have massive, massive consequences. It's going to hurt Australia. people. It's going to be hurting people with higher interest rates. It's going to be hurting them if they're saving for, say, their first home, et cetera. Yes. Uh, it's going to erode the value of their pay packet. And it's been done by a Liberal government who engaged in poor and reckless um, you know, financial management, who, who've blown the, the, um, the, the budget to smithereens. And why do we get to say that? Because John Howard and Peter Costello said it about the last four or five days. Mm. So they've actually said it. They've criticised it. And it's not just that. As someone's mentioned here, supply chain interruptions due to yes. COVID restrictions sacking workers through mandates yes. has increased labor costs like all of these things um poor energy policy which has made it difficult to get cheap energy all of these things contribute to inflation Ooh. and it's like a, a perfect storm which uh, i'm really concerned about it because of the levels of private debt the the reserve bank eventually will be forced into raising interest rates which will cause a lot of pain for a lot of people and we and in also the, the government's in yeah. more debt than ever yeah and we in the lib dems were warning about inflation many months ago, four yeah. or five months ago at least, we were talking about this and you know, not, not to big note myself, but I was saying it on Twitter and actually criticising the Reserve Bank because I thought they were in la-la land and here it's all, and, and I think they still are, by the way, and again, Costello was reflecting, I think it was either, was it Costello or Howard, that doesn't really matter, they were reflecting on they didn't think the RBA got it. Mm. Well, we do need to bring poor John Ruddick, who's sitting there quietly all by himself at the moment. We do need to bring John into the conversation as well. John, what have you been getting up to? I know you had the that Freedom Ball up there in Sydney, which was a bit, bit controversial. What have you been up to and what have you got going on for the campaign in the, in the foreseeable weeks? Well, look, the Freedom Ball was an enormous amount of fun. It was like, uh, you know, the, the, the venue had to be... Uh, undisclosed until a couple of hours to go but look there was two three hundred people there it was just magnificent Ruskan came up uh, Arby came up and um look was, I've never been look you know when you go to Liberal Party events and I've been to one or two of them over the last few decades there's always tension in the air that person over there hates him and she hates him and you know um there's always there's always sort of undercurrents and agendas going on uh, but at the Freedom Ball, it was just uh, it was just magnificent. So yes, thank you for reminding me about that. Uh, well, look, I mean, look, everything's been dominated. Look, well, I suppose on December the fifteenth, we were meant to have the end of vaccine passports in this state, and it certainly became voluntary for private businesses to say whether they wanted to let unvaxxed people in. Now, I had assumed that ninety percent of small businesses would say. Well, we just don't even want to think about it. We don't. We're not going to put a sign up at the front. You know, we just we want we want customers. You know, uh, but look to my disappointment, uh, as an unvaxxed person, I can assure you. Well, look certainly on the North Shore where I live, I would say eighty percent of businesses have got a little green sticker, not a great a big green sticker at the front saying "Do not come in if you are not vaxxed." Okay, so there's five pubs in North Sydney, and I have given them a quite a bit of patron over the last couple of decades, <laughs> and only one of them will let me in. Wow. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I hope that that will go because of this Omicron thing. Now, Omicron burst into the world on November the 14th. The, the, uh, the, the WHO, the World Health, Health Organization, said it was a variant of concern and it was first detected in South Africa. And, and we would all remember the hoopla when it was, when it first, uh, came, uh, you know, when it was first announced by the WHO. Now, you know, I watched, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this video, I saw within the first sort of day or two, South African frontline doctors saying, this is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Most of our paid, most of the people that we have diagnosed with uh, Omicron, they were in hospital for something else. And they, they were, they remarkably, they said, look, it's remarkably mild symptoms. 
And I thought, okay, well, that's pretty good. And yeah, as, as is sort of, you know, I, we've all become experts on viruses in the last two years, but you know, I understand that viruses over time tend to dissipate in, in their lethality, but at the same time uh, become more infectious. Okay, so I thought, well, look, this, this is good. Okay, now then, then it hit, hit Australia. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, look, I know a lot of people that have got it in Sydney right now. And, you know, like uh, uh, eight days ago, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning and I was, you know, just all the classic flu symptoms. Not, not a, out of all the flus I've ever had in my life, it would have been mid-range. Hmm. Uh, I did vomit, which I don't normally do uh, with a flu. And then, look, you know, it was just sort of like I had the f- mild flu, not mild, I was in bed <laughs> for a day. Oh, yes, yes, thank you, Cam. And putting his right. mask on so you don't spread it via Zoom. That's right, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you're protected now, definitely. Well, <laughs> uh, just, tell them, just tell them it wasn't a joke in terms of what we were talking about before we started. <laughs> no, there's, there's actually, this is unfortunately, perversely, seriously true. Yes, yeah, well. Uh, look, I, I was walking, I, I went for a walk late last night. And I saw a guy in his car, you know, about 11 o'clock at night and he's got his windows up all by himself. He's got his mask on. Uh, but look, the good news is, look, I mean, Robert Malone, I know, look, there are a lot of high profile COVID sceptics out there, people with qualifications. Now, some of these people, I think, are a bit loopy. I'm not going to name names, but some of them do say some crazy things. Robert Malone who was on Joe Rogan last week, and I'm sure a lot of people watched, he's an extremely impressive guy. And he said early on in this Omicron thing, he said, look, we should be celebrating this. It is COVID. It is a variant of COVID. It's not, it's not like a flu. It, you know, it, it's part of the COVID family, whatever the hell that means. Um, so if you catch it, it's going to give you immunity uh, from, from COVID. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's so mild. And, and Robert Malone said, we should let this thing, we should let this thing rip. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick Coatesworth, uh, early on, early on in, in Omicron, he went on Channel 9 and he said the same thing. He said, look, if, 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 if it turns out to be very mild, we're better off letting it circulate. So I don't know why the hell we still want to have QR codes because they've still got stupid QR codes everywhere. Um, I don't know why we want to wear masks. I mean, this is a good thing, what's happening with Omicron. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's sweeping over Sydney and the experience in South Africa is... It comes in and a hell of a lot of people get it and then it crashes. That's exactly what's going to happen here. Now, well, I, I, I was definitely one of those 50 million people that have watched that on Spotify, um, that right. Joe Rogan thing. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Can I um, ask you a question, John? Yes. You mentioned before about businesses, are cho- some businesses are choosing to implement this um, vaccine passport thing. Yes. Now, I'm not familiar with the laws in New South Wales on how they can do that. But in Victoria, the only thing that gives businesses the legal authority to ask for someone's vaccination status is the emergency power mandates. Okay. And if a business is not mandated to do it, then they have no legal authority. In fact, it's a criminal offence under Commonwealth law to use immunisation data uh, without authority. Under what authority are these businesses using this data? Is there... Spe- is there some sort of option in, in New, under New South Wales emergency laws? I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very good question. But yeah. uh, I can absolutely, I mean, I live in a business dis- district and I can assure you that there's a hell of a lot of science. I mean, look, when we've been out to dinner with my, my family uh, a couple of times. We really had to ring around a lot of places uh, to find people, uh, a, a restaurant that would take unvaxxed people. So, uh, you yeah, know, but look, surely, surely after this... Uh, after this Omicron thing, uh, you know, and once it's washed over us, surely some sanity is going to come back to the world. That's what we're hoping. Sure, I mean, I sort of agree with Cam that it's, you know, it feels like we are at peak COVID mania now. It's, mm. I'm hoping it's in its death throes all around the world. Um, and, you know, I, I've got a feeling the focus groups have changed because in the, at least in the English speaking world, Canada, the US, England and Australia, you know, people, health authorities are coming out and admitting, oh, yeah, well, a lot of people have been diagnosed with COVID, but in fact, they're in hospital with something else and they just happen to have COVID. Mm. They all came out and said that within about 24 hours. So I think, I think I'm hoping the tide is going to turn. Mm. But I would disagree with my two uh, esteemed uh, co-panellists uh, on one point. I reckon, I reckon this COVID thing is going to keep going until the election. 
Uh, now, I'll tell you why. Now, look, just on a side, side point, sports bet has a market on when the election will be called, and it's got its very, very short price favourite for May. So I think, you know, these people, you know, uh, so let's assume that's the case. Betting markets aren't always right, but, yeah, it's a dollar twenty to bet on whether you think the federal election is going to be in May. May and April, uh, March and April, about $5. But look, I think what's happening, uh, I, I think these guys, uh, you know, they can't stop this juggernaut that they've let out, even though the public might be sort of, you know, becoming very sceptical of it. We've got kids boosters starting in about four days' time uh, across Australia. Thank you very much. Okay, for five-year-olds. Now, um, I reckon that's going to freak out a lot of people. In fact, I know a hell of a lot of people who were very, very fine with having a vaccination, uh, but who are adamant saying no way on god's earth are uh, my kids are uh, gonna, gonna get you know, the, the young kids and i think the 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 other interesting thing is is this booster program you know that the look well, i've looked hard for it and so correct me if i'm wrong somebody uh, on, on the on the chat or something but i cannot find official data on how many australians have had the booster now when the vaccination program uh, uh, first rolled out Every day you could go onto the Federal Department of Health, you know, it's gone up 2%, 3%, 4%, you know, you could see it creep up. I don't know how many people have had the booster, okay? And, and now, now at the moment, the booster is not compulsory. There's no mandate of the boosters, except for certain industries. You know, is that... Is Apparently that in West off? Australia there is, though. Yeah, oh, sorry, good point. Yes, yes, yep. exactly, in Western Australia. That's right, that's right. And I, I'll be very interested to see that first Western Australian uh, Freedom Rally I reckon they've had some big rallies over there. I reckon it'll be about three times bigger, uh, the next one. So, uh, look, the, the other thing I've been doing over the break is, uh, look, I have sort of disagreed my entire life with uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, you know, he's he's a hardcore guy, Democrat. guy, hates Trump. You know, he's anti anti-capitalism and all these things. But boy, oh boy, you know, it's the best-selling book on the planet for about two months now, the, the Robert F. Kennedy, the, the, the book's called the, the Real Dr. Fauci. It is, uh, every chapter is jaw dropping. Uh, I am on my second reading of it now. Because oh, really? It's so good. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. I listened to the Audible and I had to buy the actual book because I <laughs> made notes all over the place. It's amazing. It's terrifying. It's amazing it he's been able to bring it all into one place. And it's not just about Fauci, it's about a whole bunch of things over the last few decades. Um, with uh, our health authorities and, and pharmaceutical companies. I'm very, very happy to see that you're you're looking well, though, John, after getting yes. here. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I had my own, for those of you that follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I had my own COVID scare yesterday. Yes, I um, saw that. <laughs> I did it. I woke up with a sore throat and a headache and <laughs> I um, did a rapid antigen test. I've only got two left and I used one of them and my wife said, don't be stupid. You just drank too much wine last night and snored. And of course yeah. she was right, but anyway. <laughs> well, well, I don't have that, COVID. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. Except I, I drank too much wine, that's all. <laughs> well, on the rapid antigen test, when I first took it, it said negative. Then somebody said, no, you've got to really shove it up there. I yeah. said, okay, and then it came back. You've got to up. shove it up a bit, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Not very fun. Now, before we sort of move on again, we do have John's uh, blistery history coming up, but I wanted to say uh, for New South Wales, we've got some Sen uh, some candidate announcements for House of Reps coming up very soon in the next week or so. We've been getting them all organised and getting their social media. We've got, I think there's 11 endorsed so far. We've got some excellent candidates coming up. Victoria, we've got some more candidates being announced on Friday. Uh, and some more the following week, I'm hoping. Queensland has already announced a bunch and I, I know there's a few in the works as well. So um, there's a few kind of still working in some other states, particularly WA, Tasmania, South Australia. South Australia have got a few things. They've got a really great team happening in South Australia at the moment and really kind of pushing, bringing their volunteers together and bringing the new candidates um, to happen along through there. But uh, have any of you three got any particular events coming up that we want to talk about like in terms of campaign events no well no, i'm still really hitting a newcastle the... freedom rally in about um about two weeks time i think brilliant looking very much forward to yes excellent there, there is a barbecue happening in yes. uh uh i'm temple sure Stowe. Temple, temple Stowe. yes that yep. i'll be going to so any victorian members that want to come along and support that it's uh it's a new 
branch. It's um, Saturday the 15th. Um, yeah, so I'll be there with bells on. It'll be great. Uh, I, I love barbecues. Everyone loves barbecues, right? Who <laughs> hates barbecues? What sort of person doesn't like barbecues? Even vegans like barbecues. We've got a lot of barbecues happening all around the place. And in fact, uh, one of our, our uh, Karangamite candidate, Paul Barker, is doing a barbecue every weekend around his district as well. So if you are listening to this and you want to get involved in any of that, obviously, you know, you can get onto our website and leave a leave a message on there, or you can email directly at contact at ldp.org.au because um, there's a lot of stuff going on and, and all hands on deck. It's we're gonna hit the hit the crazy road now. Um, yes, people are saying you can eat meat. Of course we can. We love meat, but vegans are definitely welcome and vegetarians. We cater for all. Um, now, John, I've, I've got an event I'd like to give a quick plug oh. to. Victor Tay is our candidate in Warrawa. He's a terrific yes. guy. He's a pastor of a church. Uh, he's a lovely fellow. He's a he's a highly intelligent, true libertarian. He's a very devout Christian, uh, but he's campaigning very hard. And he's got a campaign event on the 22nd of January, which I will be attending as well. Brilliant. Victor is uh, a real go getter. He is. He's awesome. Yes. He also, um, I'm going to be appearing on. Uh, Andrew Bogut's podcast very uh, soon. I've already recorded yay. that. I don't know exactly when that'll be published, but I'll share that on social media. So that'll be a bit of fun. And um, also I'm going to be appearing on Sky again tomorrow night. So we'll start be starting television again. I, I know that Campbell yes. was on television. Was it last night? Yeah. So yeah, oh, yeah. the it television did, um, starting again. Corey's show last night at 8.30 Southern time. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant. Now we will um, get into John's blistery history. I'm going to give you about five minutes, John, if that. We've got a whole bunch of questions uh, in the chat box. People are throwing in all sorts of stuff happening in there. Uh, John, what have you got for us tonight on blistery history? I want to talk, Kirsty, about something that's more important than COVID, more important than the debt, more important than global warming, and that is China. China. Okay. I want to give people a bit of an overview of China because if we, need, if we want to know, if you care about the next generation, and that's really what politics is about, is caring where we're going to be in a century or two from now, okay, well, we've got to really get our heads around this China situation. Now, uh, if we go, and I, so I think the way to, to understand the trajectory of China from here, we need to see where it's come from. Now, if we go back in time to about 10,000 BC, Human beings had pretty much populated the entire planet, islands across the South Pacific, Tasmania, South America. Where humans were everywhere, okay? But we were hunter-gatherers, except now that about 10,000 BC, in four parts of the world, uh, people started building farms, the, what was called the Neolithic Revolution. And those four places were all around massive uh, river, river systems. So it was Egypt, Mesopotamia, which is Iraq, the Indus Valley, which is now sort of Pakistan, India, more Pakistan. And also there's three massive river systems in China and they, they, they started farming there. Now, the interesting thing is the other three, so Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley, they all interacted with each other and they exchanged trade, they probably went to war with each other from time to time, but they were, you know, they were, they sort of all very, very well aware of each other. China, on the other hand, was hidden behind the Himalayas and it's extremely fertile. And they've got, as you can see in Australia, they've got these three big river systems. And, you know, they became very, very, you know, very advanced. And they started having writing systems about the same time as the, as people around the Mediterranean. Now, then what happened was uh, they started, uh, they, they had an emperor that started about 2000 BC. Now, up until the 1950s, most people thought that the stories of those very ancient emperors were myth just myths, fairy tales. But they've done the, the archaeology in the last few decades has shown no, all, all those ancient myths turned out to be accurate, quite similar to a lot of the stories in the Bible, which people thought were myths, then archaeology confirms them. Now, the most, the most significant Chinese person who has ever lived is easily Confucius, who was about 500 years before Christ. There he is. Uh, you know, he's, he's got three, about three million descendants today who, who they've documented, is, uh, still descendants of. Now, this guy, we think of him as sort of like another figure, like a Jesus or a Muhammad or a Buddha, uh, but the, he wasn't really religious. He didn't really talk about an afterlife. He, he, the only thing he did say to venerate your parents, uh, but he was a very good person. 
and he was talking about being honest and he was talking about being kind and he was talking about being hard and he loved money and he encouraged people to love money. Uh, and the, the, the big difference, uh, and, and he was very pro-family, uh, the big difference between sort of Confucius and the heroes of Western civilization, whether that's the Judeo-Christian or the Greco-Roman tradition, uh, who all celebrate the underdog and also celebrate the rebel, uh, Confucius, big part of his teaching was obey authority, which isn't a very libertarian principle. And so the Chinese do have this sort of thing in their system where they think to obey authority. But the other point that should be made is you can go onto the web, to a website and they rank the, the, the bloodiest wars in all of human history. Five or six of them have been Chinese civil wars. So when the blood runs in China, it runs in rivers. Okay, so, you know, and so, so when they do get sick of the government, sick of the emperor, it really goes, it really goes crazy. Now, they had this civilization over there. And so, so when, when the Dark Ages were on in Europe, China had twice the population of all of Europe. And it was like, you know, it was a golden age. So these things sort of go up and down. Now, then when, when the Europeans go out and explore the world and colonize the world, China was in a very much a low point. This is sort of in the 1600s, 1700s. And Napoleon famously said, he said, uh, you know, don't wake China up because when you do, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run the whole show. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we're here. The Ch China has well and truly woken up. Uh, now, now the, the, the emperor, uh, the, the last emperor got deposed in 1911. And, you know, and that was a bad monarchy in terms of it was an absolute monarchy. They never had any suggestion of having a parliamentary constitutional monarchy over there in China. Uh, so they, then they, um, you know, now often what happens when you knock over a monarchy, and basically what always happens when you knock over a monarchy, there's chaos, and uh, like in Russia, uh, and so they had chaos there for for a few decades. And the communists came along in 1949 under Mao Zedong, uh, and they, you know, became a communist state. They, you know, brutally enforced it. Now the interesting thing is, you had China and you had Russia, both communists both for the first few years friendly. They then had a competition to see who could be the most pure Marxist. <laughs> China won that. <laughs> China, China went far, far more intense Marxist than Russia. And look, yeah, Russia was Russia was Russia, it's pretty right. bad. And then you had uh, you know, and then they had dreadful famines and 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 Matt, look, they had a famine in 1959, killed about 30 million people, caused by communism, okay. And then uh, they, uh, Mao stepped aside for a while. Uh, and, and then they, they, Deng Xiaoping came in for a brief period in the early 60s. And then you had, uh, you know, the market, he brought in some market reforms, the, the, the famine sort of ended. Uh, but then Mao made this massive comeback in the mid 60s. And that was the Cultural Revolution. And that's when they really went crazy. And they killed about 3 million people, not through, not through famine, but through persecution. They used to throw people outside out of buildings, people who used to be landlords or, you know, owned, uh, had been overseas. So then finally, when the monster Mao died, Deng Xiaoping, after a little period, becomes the leader. Now, Deng Xiaoping really was a great figure because, you know, he said, look, white cat, black cat doesn't really matter. I just want a cat that catches the mouse. And what he was saying is he says, look, it doesn't matter if it's communism or capitalism, as long as it works, as long as it feeds the people. And the Chinese people were very entrepreneurial, I think because of Confucius, uh, you know, they, they really embraced it. And people in the West said this was terrific. And, and, and the West loved it because it was China and America became friends when, when Nixon went over to visit them. And it sort of isolated the Soviet Union, which helped bring down the Soviet Union. Hmm. So China and America were buddy, buddy, buddies. And uh, then you had, uh, you know, everyone thought China was going to liberalize with time. And they had the Tiananmen Square protests which went on for about two months before they crushed it i think we've got a photo there of just how big those protests were there for a while and then they they crushed those protests now that that is a protest everybody i mean you everyone's seen those pictures of uh Tiananmen Square before. now what has happened now is i know i'm probably way out of time kirsty yes so i'm just i'm gonna <laughs> skip, I, i'm gonna skip to the end right now okay hello What's happened? China was going good. It was getting more liberal. It, well, you could go into China and buy Bibles, and it was you know Western ideas were coming in. The internet was going to come in. It's really all turned around with with this new guy. And and they used to have a succession of leaders who would step down after their five year term or whatever it was. Xi Jinping came, comes along in two thousand and twelve. You know, and it's uh, turned very illiberal. 
uh, and it's turn and you know and become militaristic and uh, you know it's a it's a big concern. Now some people say, and I think Campbell, you've said on oh, this guy, you know, we want parliamentary democracy in China. Now, <clears throat> if we think that one through, if China became what we want, which we ideally we'd want it to become a liberal parliamentary democracy, okay, and you know, that's it. That's going to make China easily the most powerful country on earth. Okay, so uh, yeah, which would yeah, we we want liberalisation in China, but I'm saying it, it is a conundrum. When I hear hawks talk about China, say, oh yeah, we've got to confront them, we've got to confront them. I'm thinking, do we really want to confront? Are you uh, are you really China? saying you want them to remain a totalitarian no, no, one party no, no, state? No, good question. It sounded like that, Campbell. So thanks for pulling me up. Now, what I'm saying is this: it is a conundrum. When I hear hawks say. We've got it. We've got to confront them militarily, and we've got to, you know, pr get them push, push them to to, to liberalise. Okay, I th well, well, about confronting the military. I'm thinking, you know, look, you know, do we really want to have a you know, a World War Three, which could be so bloody? Uh, but then when I hear Dubs talk about China, I say, oh no, we've got to be nice to China. I'm, mm -hmm. I sort of, I think, well, what are you guys talking about? These guys could be like the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's a mystery. I don't know what to do, but it's that I'm just saying I want to put it on the history blistery because it's it's a big deal and we need to be all thinking about it. It is a big deal. And of course we do have, I'm not sure about the number, but we do have the Confucius Institutes in many of our universities here in Australia as well. Um, I've been to China a bunch of times and I must say I, I loved it. And it's amazing going into Tiananmen Square and you still see there's still bullet holes in the walls and, and it's, it is an amazing country and they play the long game. They've been at it for many, many thousands of years. And I won't be going to China anytime soon. I don't think I'll be going again. Uh, been, I'd love to go. I'd love to yeah. go, but I'm on a list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean, David. It's like I went in business prior to being in politics that I went on many occasions. If uh, people search around on the internet, you'll find some photos of me shaking President Xi's hand and oh. Lisa with the First Lady of China when they came here for G20. So met a number of the other Politburo people as well. I would never go there again. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm actually on a list. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, the Chinese I'm Chinese go, David, what I'm saying is I, I've said some stuff on Sky. I suspect that I'm on a list. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not no, even going to Hong Kong. <laughs> the Chinese Communist Party has a page on me and my uh, support of Falun Dafa in Australia and how yeah. I'm a, a traitor of the Australian people and... Um, I'm arguing with the honourable state broadcaster of the ABC, and they did a big page on me. And um, I don't, I don't, I might be able to get in, but I might not be able to get out. So right. you'll be, you'll be disappeared. That. Yes. yes. Hmm. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get to a few of the questions, and that in the chat, uh, anonymous attendee has asked, "When is uh, John's Senate running mates being announced?" Do we have any more okay. information on that? Okay, I suspect by the end of January. Um, we've look. I think you'll be quite. I, I'm very pleased with that. Uh, we want we want six candidates in total, but I think we're almost certain to have number two and number three sorted out by the end of January, and I think people will be very very happy with those selections. Um, excellent. I know there's some great ones, and I can't wait for some of them to be announced as well. Um, yes. Talking about China, there's a question here from Pete. What happens if they take Taiwan? Okay, well, look, there's all this talk about Taiwan. Okay, I feel pretty certain that it's just rhetoric. Uh, now, the, the Chinese government whips it up. They whips it up. I mean, my, my wife went, uh, grew up in Shanghai, and she said, you know, in every classroom, they had a big picture of Taiwan. You know, it's the missing, the missing piece of the family, you know. And they, they use it to whip up nationalist anti-Western sentiment. But there is, no, there is no upside in China invading Taiwan. Mm. I mean, it's, it's only going to cause a, it could easily cause a nuclear war, which everyone's going to lose from, but particularly China. And if they did do it, if they were dumb enough to move against Taiwan, the US still has the best submarine fleet on the planet, and submarines basically can't be detected. A little bit, but I mean, aircraft carriers can be bombed, but America's got a ton of submarines, and they can just take out the, the Chinese East Coast, all the military facilities, by morning tea. Mm. So I don't think that, and why would they want to do it? Now, they're going to keep talking about it. 
and Western Hawks want to keep talking about it. And I, I guess we've got to be on our toes, but I just don't think they're going to do it. The trouble I, is, I'll just give you a, a slight contrary thing. I'm not disagreeing with you that it, I don't think any person of sound mind would, uh, would, would start it. It's just if they miscalculate, if someone yeah, miscalculates. Yeah, yeah. That's the trouble. And World yeah. War One's got some... Well, World War One's the best example of that sort of uh, the tripwire um, problem and, and people crossing those wires and then things just escalating and not being able to be pulled back. You know, and they, you know, what troubles me, John, is the, the very belligerent um, incursions into Taiwanese airspace and that, like, if, you know, if, if you know, if, if, a, if a Taiwan, Taiwan sort of pilot or air defence mob do the wrong thing and there's an yeah. incident, so a Chinese aircraft were shot down, you yeah. know, what happens then? That that's what worries me. I, I agree I with you. they're not no one's, I don't think people are gonna do it seriously, but mm, mm. Then, then what happens in an escalation? That's right. You could have like a Doctor Strange Love rogue type of pilot go and like try and kick it off. Yep. Or there could be internal tension, political tension in Beijing. Mm. And to sort of establish your leadership, you could go and hit Taiwan. So you, you know, it's not impossible, and we absolutely have to be fully prepared for it. I'm pretty sure the US would win right now, but I mean, who the hell knows in five to ten years? You know, I mean, if we keep electing people like Joe Biden, and they keep having people like Xi Jinping there, you know, well, it's not looking great. I, I think one of the things that we have to remember here. I mean, I'm, I'm as anti-war as they come, and one of the key things to preventing war. I think it's, was it Bastiat said when um, good uh, armies don't cross borders when goods do, um, maintaining trade yeah, right. with as many countries as possible means that there is a large number of people in both countries that have a vested interest in making sure that conflict never happens. And that's why I'm very concerned when I hear calls for tariffs, for sanctions, for you know, mm -hmm. trade blockades, these sort of things. Uh, libertarians should never support these because this is always what happens before war. Um, they cut off trade, then the number of people who have vested interests in peace um, become minimalized, and then you end up with all sorts of horrible things happen. So, um, you know, when you hear some people in Australia would say, oh, we should cut trade with China and all this sort of thing, this is a very, very dangerous mm. type of uh, language to use. We, we should, you know, be wary of our trading partners and be mindful of of um, you know things that they that you know human rights issues, but um, cutting off trade is not something that's going to be helpful to peace at all. Mm. We have to maintain. I trade. love that quote, Dave. I love yeah. that quote you started with. When goods cross borders, armies don't. So I've never heard it before. Where, where, where I think I think it's from? Bastiat. I, I have to double check it, but it's it, yeah. But you've, basically, you've, countries countries that trade with each other ensure that. Um, there's a large capitalist class yeah, of people absolutely. that have a vested interest in opposing war, and that's that's yeah. what we that's what we want. We want people to oppose war, but in all countries, yeah. because war is a catastrophe. Catastrophe. You've just significantly influenced my own thinking on the matter, David. That's the compliment of the evening. Oh, well, I will thank say you. though, it doesn't always work out that way. So in World War Two, with Japan. The oil embargo, the um, press, you know, steel, you know, steel and other metals, uh, the, those embargoes, etc., probably forced them. Oh, off. that triggered Pearl Harbor, absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah well, they, yeah, they, they were going to, they were rampaging across China at the time, anyway. But, uh, yeah. but, but it, it certainly, you know, didn't didn't help. But in World War One, um, people don't seem to get this, but uh, Europe and you know, they were they were very inter interdependent. They were. There was there was there was a huge yeah you know, there was there was plenty you know there was globalization back then um, and I don't know that you know my understanding of history I'm not sure that you know sort of sanctions and tariffs ever came into it that was just it was on but you know the other thing that we have to remember with trade is it's a way of uh, people from different cultures and backgrounds finding a way to to um, cooperate. With each other in a in a peaceful way. This is this is why trade is so important, both you know within countries and and between countries. I mean, you know, e even even the idea of shutting down borders within Australia has created these isolated hmm. states that you know like have turned against each other. Like I've never in my whole life, 
you know, there's been like joking rivalry between states, you know, they joke about between Sydney and Melbourne and Queensland and stuff. But since the borders have been closed, there's been this like real sort of nasty David, attitude. David, Queensland hospitals are for Queensland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. a great example yeah. though, right? Because How outrageous. Baby, babies yeah. can die on the border because they're not from Queensland. That's it's, a, right. it's a great example though, because that is a form of, um, you know, interstate trade, right? Like someone wanting health services across the border. And it's, it, it's a horrific thing that they've mm. done. So yeah, mm. absolutely. It's a great example. Now I'm going to take it right off China now and come back to Australia. Um, there's a question here from Darren saying, does the, uh, do the Lib Dems have an active group in Tasmania? Darren, we do have a very small group in Tasmania. Send me an email, contact at ldp.org.au, and we will hook you up. Um, there is a question from Peter saying, um, how, what about the preference with, the, with Clive's party, UAP? After all, they have all of Clive's money. And Craig Kelly, how's that all going with us? People often ask about you know, do we have any money from them or how not, are our preferences not, going there? What not, happens not, there? Not, well, not, not, to, not to my knowledge, Kirsty. Um, I think I, I'll probably make the point again because there might be a slightly different audience tonight. I mean, why did we do that? Mm. Will there be more? Will there, the, first, the first point I make is that we, um, last year for quite some time, we're getting feedback from members and from part, people who were supporting the party but weren't members saying, look, for God's sake, we don't want you uh, in the minor parties all beating each other up. We want you to come to agreements with people like Palmer, Hanson, Cata, et cetera. And so the Palmer one was the first one. Um, the advantage of it is, is that we have, um, if, if you like, if you think of it as, the, as a battleship, if UAP is a battleship with, with great long range guns, those guns are pointed at people other than us. Mm. Uh, and uh, we also um, hope to benefit from um, on polling booths that we can't staff, that we will have people handing out how to votes for, um, you know, give, uh, advocating a second preference for our person, even though we can't have our people on the ground. Um, and maybe he will in some way financially support us down the track but uh, at this stage, he, he hasn't, to my knowledge. Um, and I've quite cheerfully told the media, well, if, you know, so I'm not making a secret about it, I've said to the media, well, if, if Mr Palmer wants to support us, we'll, 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 we'll be quite appreciative and we'll take his money. <laughs> Question. Now, there is a comment from Clinton saying he will volunteer in Queensland. He's just moved from Victoria, so that's great. Clinton, if you tag yourself as a volunteer on the website, uh, you'll get sort of earmarked there or you can email in. Peter's asking, is there anyone for Wide Bay in Queensland? That I'm not sure of just yet. But as, as I said, if you flick an email in, uh, we can find out for you and get all the answers Absolutely. there. Thank you. As Wide Bay is a great area and they've Welcome. been very, very good about the being anti the mandates as well, which has been great. So I know there's a lot of really activated people in that area. Uh, let's have a look here. There's a lot of comments about Joe Rogan and, and uh, Dr. Malone. Um, uh, let's have a look what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. There's a whole lot of, a lot of, not a lot of questions. There's a whole lot of comments happening there. And I don't want to, oh, actually, John says we've got to get rid of the cesspit that's in Hinkler uh, district. So um, hopefully we'll have a very good candidate up there as well. Now, so I think, unless anyone's got some pressing questions, I'd also like to know from our audience, um, what do you want from Libby Chat? We are going to be, as from next week, we'll start obviously having those Freedom Manifesto videos and talking more about each policy, each of those 10 policies individually leading up through the election campaign. Uh, and what, that, what we're going to do with that is just give you a chance to kind of relate those policies into your real life. How do they affect you and how you can easily explain them to your friends and family as well. And obviously we've got these videos that will be coming out. And uh, I think it was John that mentioned that earlier as well. We're going to have these short videos that you'll be able to share with your friends and family, because we know we're not going to get a whole lot on mainstream media apart from Sky, which has also been, has been quite wonderful for us. So a lot of what we do is going to be on social media. So I hope that you're following 
all of our uh, candidates that are already announced. And obviously you'll get information for your district when you, or if you have a really good candidate coming up, you'll get that information when they're announced. You'll get links to their email address where you can contact them directly. You'll get links to their Facebook and their other socials as well. So we've got a lot of really great candidates coming up and they are going to be announced over the coming weeks uh, when we find out, of course, as well, when the actual election is. Uh, Marcus says that he loved my Margaret Thatcher mug. Thanks, Marcus. That's actually from the IPA, who we also love. Um, let's have a look through here. Just sort of, there's a lot of comments. I'm just chatting through all of these comments. Um, James mentions, like, particularly in, uh, I think it's about Sydney, um, why the QR code still, if we're in a place less than four hours, it's not a close contact anymore. So why aren't people pushing back on the, on the QR codes as much yet? I don't know myself. I don't use oh, such a good question because yeah. of them. They're now telling you. I, I get about three a day. Say so I get a message from Service New South Wales and text messages. Say so you have been a close contact with somebody. Now yeah. in the past, when Ross Cameron got that only three weeks ago, he's put in quarantine for a week. Mm. Now they just say, uh, you've been a close contact. Um, be careful. You know, monitor for <laughs> symptoms. Okay. So what the hell is the point of the stupid QR code oh, now? Yeah. It, 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 that, that's what I think is the is the sort of the beginning of the end of this crap, um, if I may say so. It's just suddenly, you know, the language has changed from government. Yes. Um, yes. The reset, the great re... <laughs> if you'll excuse me, this is another great reset. The great reset. Um and, and re, refocus of our bureaucrats and our politicians is on. Um, the biggest backflip started, I think, with your Premier, David, uh, when one minute he was having a lockdown, suddenly he was opening up because New South Wales were, you know, it was last year. Um, and that passed without a, a ripple on a duck bond. But I think people do inherently, a lot of people are getting it. Yeah, That's look, I, I think, you know, if the QR codes were just to notify you that you'd been near someone that had had COVID, People would be fine with it. But, like, we've seen what they use it for. They use it for yeah. excluding people from society. Like, and and um, that when they first brought it in, they didn't tell us that's what they were going to use it for. They said initially they were very clear about it. We're going to use this for contact tracing. Now they're using it for notification. Mm. But they've been using it for excluding people. Um, we can't trust government with this sort of system. So it has to go. Mm. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like well, if it was just for notifications meantime, and could get an absolute concrete guarantee that that's all it was going to be used for, I don't think many people would object to that. They'd just say, well, you know, that's okay. Like it's helpful to know if I've been near someone that's sick, but um, we know that they take it further than that. They'll use it for more things. We can't trust them. We have to take it away. We have to get rid of it. And in yeah. the meantime, if you've got a, a mobile phone that has problems reaching the network at that critical moment... That's yeah. why. No, that's just terrible. I mean, do 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 what you legally must do. But if your phone just plays up, well, I yeah, I'm. Uh, there's a comment here from Les who says, "I don't QR code." Nope, the amount of spam calls I got is unreal. And I did QR codes a little bit in 2020, maybe three or four times. I stopped it because of all the spam and that. So last year, I didn't do, use one QR code. I, I signed in it. Bunnings if I had to, and I'd scribble something down, um, but I haven't used them for that reason. Um, well, as, as a candidate for Parliament, I just want to put on the record, I've absolutely 100% used the QR code <laughs> every single time. <laughs> I'm happy to sign something. As I say, I'll, I'll happy to sign a piece of paper, but I won't be using my phone. Um, there's a few more comments here. Um, people, Don, who's saying, what more can we do? I'm in Victoria. Who can I contact? Don, you can either put a message on the website, ldp.org.au, use a website contact, or you can send an email straight into contact at ldp.org.au because... As I said, we, the more the merrier. We need lots of people, lots of volunteers. We want to have a heap of candidates around. So wherever you are in Australia, please do just get in touch. We'll um, we'll get something for you to do. That's for sure. Oh, and another thing in Victoria, just briefly, if I may, Kirsty, sorry. Um, my office. Many of you may know that my office was um, attacked by a vandal some months ago. Um, it's reopening later this month, and I was going to advertise and have an opening party, except my staff said. Don't be an idiot. You'll end up with 10,000 people coming to your office. But I will um, probably send out a message to members and stuff um, uh, to come along and 
be happy that my new that my old office is reopening again okay. so they had to rip up all the carpet and take out all the furniture and dry out the concrete and do structural checks and all sorts of stuff because it was a total disaster but anyway I'm going back into my office in Cheltenham later oh, this month and it's going to be wonderful I went past a couple of days ago and someone had re-put up the my hero and love heart thing because I, I know that that was all there a few months ago oh, did someone wipe it down did they it was all it was wiped off because I'd right. gone past a few times. It was wiped off, but then the other day someone had written my hero again. So that was very lovely. I get I get nice graffiti. So I not, I a, not a lot of politicians get nice graffiti like that. Love hearts and you know, that's um, I don't know who did it. I it's pretty I cute. I swear to God I didn't put it put them <laughs> up to it. I swear it wasn't like your wife or your mother or anything. No. No, um, no, 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 absolutely not. And Clinton is commenting that the Lib Dems Twitter game is strong. Yes, it has been very strong lately. And we'll put that down to Rob Cribb, who is in our communications committee and is on our NAT exec. And I think he's probably getting a little bit obsessed with it, to be honest. But um, yes, please do follow all of our Twitter, not only not only the LinkedIn page, but follow Cam, follow John, follow David as well, um, because they've all got pretty strong Twitter games, I, I, to be honest. Can, can, I, yeah, can I just say on the back of that, look, I mentioned earlier in the, the session that I'd posted some stuff about the Queensland police not arresting people because and they, and they, if, if they were serious offenders because they couldn't be bailed and they'd have to go mm. to a watch house and da 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 COVID. Now that's a story. No one here from the mainstream media has contacted me today and we've got the actual email being posted. So why I'm saying this is this campaign unless something changes dramatically, will be fought and won by Lib Dems through networks, through social media, through friends, through family, through work colleagues, and we need your support. Definitely. Uh, you know, it's just like I've said it every, almost every one of these sessions, but we need your support. If you're not on social media, you've got to get on social media. Mm. You've got to get other people on social media. You've got to spread the word. That's how we'll do it. We'll also do it with... You know, a bit of you know the regional media might be more helpful to us. Mm. Um, also, you know, we are being we've been reasonably successful up here in getting some money for things like billboards and radio ads. But it's going to be a grassroots campaign. On election day, we're going to surprise people that way. If people in the party and supporters get behind us like that, so it's just just critically important. They're going. I, to, I couldn't agree more. It, it, yep. The only media outlet that ever gets us a, regu a regular go is Sky, and I'm afraid it's a limited audience. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Um, Cam Campbell's Campbell's right. We 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 knew this from the the first week after I started and got a media advisor. He said we need to form relationships with alternative media. We need to get big on social media because once the election comes. We know this from experience. They will ignore minor parties. And I'm absolutely certain that's the case. Mm. Um, we have worked very hard to increase our social media profile. Um, at the moment on Twitter, you know, in Victorian Parliament, I'm the third biggest following on Twitter in the Victorian Parliament, hopefully soon to be number two behind Dan Andrews. Oh. I think I'm already number two <laughs> on Facebook behind Dan Andrews. Um, oh. We need to build our profile on alternative media that means through podcasts that's why i talk to you know yep um andrew bogart all of these other people and i think you know it it all adds up i think yeah is, and we can't rely on the mainstream media supporting exactly. us because they really just won't they'll just drop us like a rock yeah and as amanda lee says here we need rukshan and tofa uh, amanda um jo uh, david actually announced his um senate senate campaign through Real Rukshan, we had a few like yep. mainstream media there. And Harold Sun was there. Harold Sun was there. Harold Sun's all right. They're, it they're had pretty good. A crazy amount of views straight away. We also had Rukshan and Tofa on the last of the year episode of Liberty Chat, um, which was a lot of fun. I know the clip went up for that the other day. So follow that. And, and yes, as, as Paul has commented, Tofa has publicly said that he is a member of the party as well. So they are definitely friends of the party. And I know that both of them share. David's uh, work a lot as well down here in Victoria. Who needs mainstream media? We, we, this is the power of the people now. Look at look at all Joe Rogan. There's a that um, the chart the other day. Joe oh, yeah, Rogan's yeah. views were just way above any of the mainstream media, and and this is how it works. Well, we're at time. This was our first episode back for the year. A nice cruisy casual episode. 
Um, please, if anyone has any other questions that they need to know in terms of who's running in their area, shoot me an email, contact at ldp.org.au. Well, I'll sort of hook you up with whoever's there if you're wanting to volunteer. Or even if you think you want to put your hand up for as a candidate, you never know. We might still need people around the place. Um, obviously, join the party, volunteer, donate as well. We do need funds always. We're always going to be asking for money. Thank you. But get to the website, ldp.org.au. Don't forget, we've got these very lovely caps and bucket hats and polo shirts and T-shirts. Bucket hats look good for fishing. <laughs> or going to festivals. Do people yeah. have festivals? They look, they look daggy enough that I'd wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you I'm a daggy. Me you carry it off, David. Yeah, <laughs> caps don't <laughs> suit me. Caps don't suit me, but I reckon a bucket hat, I, yeah, that might do the trick. Righto, we need to get you one. Uh, it was quick, smart. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks to John's lovely little princess sitting on his lap right there as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you next week. Peace. Thanks, Kirsty. See you, everybody. See you, David. See you, Cam. <laughs>